Okay. All right. So as you've already noticed, and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm breaking in on your conversations, we'll, we'll be able to start those back up here in just a second. But um, it's a very untraditional service this morning. Um, definitely not what we normally do. But today is Shavuot, or Pentecost, or, it, you know, if you were going to say it out, the Shavuot is the Feast of Weeks, I believe. So the Feast of Weeks is, and we're actually going to read about that from Leviticus as we go through reading today. So what I'm doing is I'm doing a traditional reading, and I'll just tell you one thing, and I'll probably cover it. Um, some of the traditional things that they did when they would celebrate the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, is they believed that the first Pentecost was when Moses brought the Ten Commandments down from the mountain. Because of this, today's celebration for the Jews was also a celebration of the giving of the law. Now, the law is compared, much like the promised land, to milk and honey. So they would, they would make cheese blintzes, cheesecakes. They would make all kinds of sweet things and share those during Pentecost. Tres leches? I don't think they had that in Israel. But we've got Mexicans now. So did you bring a tres leches? Oh, Yes, he's the sweetest thing about you. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. All right, so anyway, but that's one of the things that they would share. They, would also, they also tended to read the book of Ruth during the, the session, but I'm not going to do that today because I want to go over just really quickly, and I mean really quickly, simply, mostly by reading the text. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, Now, there in the first three verses, Theophilus begins by talking about, you know, he, he literally says, the account I made, and O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both um, to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, thought, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Whew. I mean, that's just powerful. That's just powerful for here, um, for Luke to be sharing this account after he's already written the gospel uh, according to Luke, and then now he begins to share this information of the church being born um, through, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 4. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And notice it was through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that he would do these things. What does that mean? For you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, we also, when we commit ourselves and submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do any task that he sets to accomplish in his name, for his glory, and for his kingdom. Look at verse 12. Okay, sorry, verse 9. All right, I skipped ahead. Now, when he had spoken these things, they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. So think about this. You know, they, they saw, they saw the, the Messiah killed. Um, he was put upon a cross. He was dead in the grave. He rose again. They're, they have this impactful miracle that has just is blown their minds. And now they see Jesus taken up 
completely out of their sight. And when they had looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Does anybody think there were anything other than an angels? No. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Which is saying Jesus is coming where? Back. Okay, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is returning. Now, hey, hey, blessed lady. Oh, she's trying, trying to sneak in. Look at her now. Look at you now. Well, we're blessed that you're here. All right, so, um, you know, so Jesus is returning. Jesus is coming back. Now, look at verse 12 with me. Now, when they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is the mountain that Jesus is coming back to, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So it's a half a mile. A Sabbath day journey was a half mile. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Now all these continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And no, that's not a Honda, okay? I know everybody makes that joke, right? One accord, a Honda accord. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it's bad. But that one accord is that one in thought coming together, really trusting that God was going to do and fulfill what he had promised to the church, what he had said that he would do. It names all of the apostles, and, and it gives us the fact that, you know, even his mother is there, his brothers are there. Why are his brothers there now when before they were telling him he needed to stop what he was doing? Because they believed. They saw Jesus alive, and it changed everything for them. Verse 1 of chapter 2, and this is the, the church being born. This is why we say today is Pentecost. It is the birthday of the church. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Notice what it says there. It says, as of a rushing mighty wind. So the manifestation of the Holy Spirit coming in like it did, there's a reason for this. And I, and I truly believe, as you're going to see the individual, you know, what appeared to be tongues of fire over everyone. What was it that followed Israel around in the wilderness? Right, so it was a, a, a pillar uh, that of wind, like we would say a cyclone, and at night it was fire, and then when it says there was fire that appeared, and then they, it went to each person individually. So, you know, and I, I just, I think that's that, but, it, you know, that's speculation. The, the scripture doesn't say that. You know, there's so many different ideas and things that you can get from this. But here's the facts. They were sitting there, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't ever happen like this again. Okay, this is a unique occurrence. This is not something that is supposed to happen all the time. However, I would say that you and I can get regular fillings, infillings, pourings upon of the Holy Spirit upon us, especially when the Lord has a task for us or we need that touch from Him. And I would encourage you not to, not to think when I say something like, hey, this, this, this was unique, it doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm simply telling you we're probably not going to see tongues of fire today, nor, you know, nor can I necessarily, you know, naysay it, as, as, but I have to say it does not occur again. But here's the thing. At this moment in time where they were sitting, the house was filled with this sound that just sounded like this wind going through, this wind blowing through. And then there appeared to them in verse 3, divided tongues as of fire and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in the note that I would make to you and... Um, you know, and, and we'll read a little bit about it here in just a second. So I'm not necessarily going to start explaining yet. But if you would, 
Hold your place here in Acts, Acts chapter 2, and turn with me to Leviticus chapter 23. Because I want to see why they were here, because it said when the day of Pentecost had fully come. So now we're going to see what the day of Pentecost is. This was one of the feasts of the Lord that was commanded for them, and it's Leviticus 23, verse 15, and it is the Feast of Weeks. So, when they brought the sheave of the wave offering, what day was that? Anybody remember? It's not Passover, but it comes a couple of days after Passover, which was first fruits, okay? So they brought the feast of first fruits, and so he says, You shall count for yourselves from the day after Sabbath, from the day after you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. What is that? That's seven weeks. And then he says, and how many is seven sevens? Okay. All right. So, but he says, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour and baked with leaven. So what had they taken out of all their breads and everything else? Leaven. Here you see Mr. Paul blessed us, and he baked two loaves of leaven. Now, feel free to tear into this after it's done. I prefer you use a knife, but... You know, hey, if you just want to start picking it up and chawing on it, more power to Yeah, you can do it, Jennifer. Anyway, no, I'm kidding. Leaven is without yeast, right? Leaven is yeast. Unleavened would be without yeast. Leavened means it has yeast in it. Yes. So the Lord is telling them, put the leaven back in. Okay. All right. Now, what this means, some people say it means the Gentiles being added to the church. Some people say a lot of different things about it. But here is what he says. He just says, you're going to make this, you know, this new grain offering to the Lord. You're going to bring from your dwellings two loaves and two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. Did you measure those out according to the... No, I'm kidding. I'm messing with you. I'm blessed that you brought the loaves. What a blessing. Um, uh, and, and then they are the first fruits to the Lord. So that would be your first fruit offering. You shall offer with bread seven lambs of the first year. Tom was supposed to bring those, but I forgot to call him. I, yeah, well, the goat would be the one, you know, it was, uh, if you look at a, it says, uh, in one young bull and two rams, and they shall be offering to the Lord with their grain offering, their drink offering, and an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. And you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats, as a sin offering, and two male lambs of the year as a uh, of the first year as a sacrifice of peace offering, the priest shall wave with them the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs, and then it, you know it, it continues on and goes into the next feast and, and you know and just talks about some of the reaping and the harvesting and and you and I need to know and understand what about this. That when they come, the day has fully come, they're about to celebrate this thing, and God fulfills his promise just exactly as he said he would. Which means if he promised you that if you trust in him and you believe in him, you will be saved, then guess what? You will be saved. Okay? This is that thing of trust. This is that sign of promise, and this is the thing that he is giving to us. And, and I would honestly say, if leaven was taking sin back, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons that we wonder, you know, is leaven representing sin and the removal of the Passover and all these things, you know, or is it that purification process and that this is what life is? There's a lot of different things that we can say about it, but one of the things I can say is this, God provides. Now, if you go back to Acts... Chapter 2, what continues to happen? And here's one of the things that I want you to do when we're done with this reading is I want you guys to talk about this, to think about this, to put these things out. Um, you know, I know some of you have uh, talked about these things in the past and said, here's some of the things that I think about this, and, you know, I, I just love to hear them. So. But Peter, verse 14, 
standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, actually, no, did, i I, I got to read 513, my apologies. There were dwelling in, in, in Jerusalem, so Acts chapter 2, verse 5, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. They hear them speaking these tongues. But here's the thing, and I would challenge you to look at this, is because each and every man here is hearing each and every disciple speak in his own language. Because some people say, well, some of the disciples were speaking a, you know, a Latin, some were speaking Greek, some were speaking... No. Each person hears every speaking in his own language. What does that mean to you and me? That means it's not them hearing in their own language. It's God translating to each and every one of them in their own language. So they are hearing by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is, he is translating these tongues to each and every person. So they understand it completely and perfectly. Because they look, they go, everyone heard them speak in his own language. They're speaking in my language. And the other guy goes, no, they're speaking in my language. And, and, and they're just like, now, the text doesn't say that per se, but it does say they were all amazed and marveled and said to one another, look, are, are not those who speak Galileans? In verse 8, and how is it that we hear each in our own language with which we were born? It's pretty crazy. That there's one tongue that they're all saying, and everybody's hearing it in their own language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, verse 9, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the other parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And notice what they say. They talk about the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking, saying, they're full of new wine. They're all just drunk. So you and I, as we come together at this, I want to celebrate. I want to think about what God is telling us. And, and I just want you and I to know and understand that God can speak when we think we have no words. When you don't know what to say, you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can speak and be heard. Now, Peter stands up, and, and, and here's the thing. He begins to preach, he begins to teach, and he begins to say this there in verse 14. What time are we at here? Okay, all right. Peter, standing up with the eleven, there in verse 14, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah, Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And then the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Has that day come yet? So this is still going on. The book of Acts is still being written. It's still coming to pass. And verse 21 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Brethren, have you called on the name of the Lord? Okay. Wake the others up that are around you. Have you called personally upon the name of the Lord? All right. Amen. Amen. Um, therefore, verse 36, so just jump to verse 36 with me. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. 
When he says that they are to go and baptize in the name of what? In Matthew, the end of Matthew. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This represents the Trinity. Do you understand that Jesus himself is that personification of God? He says, when you see me, you've seen the Father. And then the Holy Spirit came upon him and stayed upon him. Guys, when we baptize in the name of Jesus Christ, we are baptizing in that Trinity. When we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we mean Jesus. And he says you do this. You're, you know, it's not that the water washes away your sins. It's because you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. You receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 38. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are fall off, as many as the Lord our God will call. How do you know if you called? Did you hear the gospel? Did we just say it? Did we just call people to repentance? So if you heard that, guess what? God's calling you. Isn't that neat? Isn't that special? And he can use you to call others. Don't hesitate to share the gospel with someone. You don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to have every answer. You just have to tell them about Jesus and what he did for them. He says here, right, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. In that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And notice what it says. They continued steadfastly. Right? So it's a continuance thing. It's something that you continue in. It's something that you do. And then he says, in the apostles' doctrine, teaching is important, guys. Teaching is incredibly important. In fellowship... And in the breaking of bread, communion, and in prayer. So here's what we're going to do. All right, We're now going to partake of communion together. On the table in front of you, on the table in front of you, is a decanter, there's cups, and there's bread. The oldest male at the table would like you to take the decanter and pour the cups for everyone else. Okay, if there is no male at the table, I don't want to say the old lady, but the, old, the eldest at the table, please pour the cup. How about that? We'll just do that. Do it now. Go ahead and do it now. Go ahead and begin to pour the cups because you guys are breaking bread together. This is a communion. Why? They're, they're not sure I can handle this. Oh, yeah? <laughs> He's shaking. He's shaking? Well, it's a big job. And it's a weird decanter. We need to get some cooler decanters. All right. Hey, and nobody died yet. It's awesome. And then hold on to them because we're going to take them together. Now, could you imagine as all, they were all sitting around, sharing around there in Acts after all this had happened. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And every time they broke bread, they remembered the promises of Jesus and what he said to them. What did he do? Did he get it on your Bible? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Out of the canner, straight out. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cups are not important. All right, you guys ready? If you would. All right, please back up here now. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
till he comes. If you would, please take the bread. Father, we thank you for this, your body that was given for us, that was broken for us, um, that was torn for us. We thank you that you took our place, that you were that substitutionary atonement. You were the one that was the perfect fit to be able to save us. We thank you for doing this, Lord, and we lift it all up to you. Let's partake. And we thank you, Lord, for this cup, the ink of the new covenant and blood written for us that reminds us, that tells us that God, that Christ, he has fulfilled the covenant. He has done all things necessary. You know, he, he said from the cross, it is finished. Here in the, in the Feast of Weeks, we are told this is the completion. This is the fulfillment. Jesus said, I did not come to, to, to do away with the Scriptures, but to fulfill them. Lord, we thank you for this fulfillment in everything that points us to Christ, that points us to you, and that reminds us that Jesus is the one that has accomplished our salvation, and it is to him that we look, and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup. Now, if you would, why don't you sing a song with me, okay? Let me turn this off.